Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Woohoo! It's impeachment week, folks. A ton of you have written to us and asked, there's so much nonsense on the news right now. What does all this impeachment stuff mean? Well, we're going to try to break it down for you as clearly as we can. First, let's talk about the process so that everybody understands the mechanics. The ability to impeach sits solely with the House of Representatives. Impeachment does not equate to guilt. It's like a grand jury indictment. It essentially means that the House has found enough evidence that they want to level a formal accusation against the president. A formal accusation of what, you may ask? According to the Constitution, a president can be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Man, that last one is a little nebulous. Is it defined in the Constitution? No, it is not! That being said, there is a lot of discussion about it in the Federalist Papers. For those of you that don't know what the Federalist Papers are, there were a series of 85 articles written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay with the intention of explaining the document to people ahead of ratification. At that period of time, there were a lot of people that weren't sure if they wanted a constitution with that much federal power. Depending on your politics and the issue, the Federalist Papers are either held up high as a gold standard or completely ignored. In the case of impeachment or the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors, Hamilton defined it as misconduct of public men or a violation of the public trust. Congress has clarified that statement over the years to be broken down into three categories. First, improperly exceeding the power and authority of the office. Second, behavior incompatible with the function and purpose of the office. Third, misusing the office for improper purpose or personal gain. So now that we understand the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors, what's the next step? The House must now hold an inquiry. The investigation will typically start with the House Judiciary Committee that will look at the entire body of evidence and make a determination over whether or not the president has crossed the line of high crimes and misdemeanors. If they believe he has, they will then make a recommendation to the House at large to hold an impeachment vote. The House then votes for articles of impeachment. To pass forward to the Senate, it requires a simple majority. If that majority is achieved, the president is impeached. Once the president is impeached, the articles move to the Senate. The Senate will then hold a trial presided over by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, in our case, Chief Justice John Roberts. At the conclusion of the trial, the members of the Senate vote. In order to be found on the charges, the president would need two-thirds of the Senate to find him guilty. Even then, his sentence does not necessarily have to be removal from office. So now that we understand the process, why is the president up for impeachment now? On the 25th of July, the president had a phone call with Ukrainian President Zelensky to congratulate him on his party's parliamentary victory. During that phone call, he asked Zelensky to investigate presidential candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden to see if Biden had stopped the investigation into his son. That in itself could be construed as an abuse of power, but it's more disturbing because it was paired with two other pieces of evidence. First, allegedly Trump wouldn't even take the call with Zelensky unless Zelensky promised to discuss Biden on the call. Second, aid to the Ukraine was held back until after the call was completed. This paints an even more severe picture of potential impropriety from the president. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Then you have to look at his other behavior. Forget the things that the Democrats complain about all the time, his language, his tweets, his attitude, all of that nonsense. Let's look at his businesses. Every other president to date has divested their personal businesses and placed their assets in a blind trust, specifically so that they would have no knowledge of where their money was invested so they couldn't improperly influence that business's success. President Carter even had to divest his family's peanut farm, although admittedly his brother still remained involved in that farm. President Trump has not done so, instead turning over his businesses to his family to manage, but let's be honest, it's completely unrealistic that he has no influence or knowledge of what's happening in those businesses. Additionally, he has almost certainly violated the Emoluments Clause, which states that he cannot accept gifts or monetary instruments from foreign powers without the express consent of Congress. Foreign powers rent space in his buildings, including China and Russia. Foreign governments have spent millions of dollars in his hotel since his presidency has begun. And Mar-a-Lago has become a de facto White House for anybody that actually wants access to the president. 
This is and has been a real problem, and frankly, I expected Congress to jump on it immediately, but they haven't because the entire legislative branch has essentially abdicated their responsibility and power in favor of never being on the hook for anything. So back to the question at hand. Is there enough here to impeach the president? Yes, there is. Depending on how seriously people are going to take some of these accusations, the president could be in real trouble for the first time. Do I think it's likely? No, because there's been enough just with the emoluments clause to push for impeachment since almost the beginning of his presidency, yet the Democrats have opted not to. Now, given that this stuff has gone on forever, phone call or no, this is being perceived as a partisan attack on the president leading up to the election. In fact, only 31% of Americans think impeachment's a good idea. So with that, I will editorialize and give you what I think is the most probable course of action for the president and the most dangerous course of action for the president. The most probable course of action is that the Democrats are going to drag this investigation on for as long as is humanly possible. I'd actually be surprised if they hold a vote before the election. The real value for them is in the investigation. The more time they get to spend upending dirt and looking into things, the greater the chance that they diminish the president in the eyes of the voters. If they rush to vote, then yes, they get to say that the president was impeached, but then it'll likely die very quickly in the Senate and the president, who is a far greater marketer than any of them, is going to turn this into a victory. I survived impeachment, they hit me with a partisan attack, and here I am stronger than ever, not backing down. And let's add to this the fact that the Democrats have attacked him relentlessly since day one on virtually everything actually reduces their credibility in this regard. They've simply cried wolf too many times. However, Trump's comments about the whistleblower and making an insinuation that back in the old days, spies were treated differently, basically saying, hey, maybe we should just kill this guy have really caused some grumblings in the Republican Party, and it opens the door for what I'm considering the most dangerous situation for the president. While Trump may be the official leader of the party, McConnell has the party by the balls. If his political calculus is telling him it's time to cut sling load on the president, he might reach across the aisle. Pelosi pushes for impeachment in the House. McConnell supports impeachment in the Senate, stabs the president in the back, returns the party to normalcy, and does all of it in the name of country before party. The 2020 election then becomes a race between an unknown new Republican and the current pack of Democrats. Likely? Probably not. Possible? If you've enjoyed the soap opera that is American politics these last four years, then you've got to admit, is there a better surprise ending cliffhanger than McConnell giving him the old, with Trump on the ground going, et tu, Mitche? Sig Haig, actor in A House of a Thousand Corpses and Jackie Brown, died at the age of 80. He acted in many, many movies and had many, many roles. And Sig will be missed by many, many people. The U.S. is sending military troops to Saudi Arabia after the recent drone attacks on oil sites. President Trump has stated that the military is there purely in a defensive capacity and they're just going to be looking out for drone attacks and missile strikes. He also stated that the U.S. does not want to go to war with Iran, but will if necessary. To which Iran responded, yeah, whatever, dude. To which Trump responded, oh yeah? Well, your banks can't hang with our banks anymore. And the Saudis were like, sweet bro, thanks. I appreciate you disregarding the fact that we're shady as umbrellas at noon. President Rouhani then stated he planned to propose a regional peace plan. And he did so at the UN summit this week in New York. His plan? The U.S. sucks and they should get out of the Middle East. Sounds legit. We'll probably go with it. Greta Thunberg has gone viral thanks to her how daring speech about climate change. The young activist brought the thunder when speaking out against world leaders at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit in New York. It was an Oscar-worthy performance that garnered a lot of attention. It even earned her the Right Livelihood Award, better known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. Supporters of the speech hailed it as galvanizing for the younger generations and a positive momentum builder for the climate change advocacy. While the message, though dramatic, was fair and on brand, there are a large contingent of people who take issue with the way the message was delivered. More specifically, the political weaponizing of children for a political agenda. It's clear that Greta cares about the environment. We appreciate that. We're not going to attack a kid for her ideas, her looks, or anything for that matter. She's a 16-year-old kid. 
What we do find interesting is that it looks like a whole bunch of adults are parading her out as a marketing tool to get their agenda across. This wasn't a school assembly or a town rally. They literally brought a 16-year-old little girl with Asperger's out to the UN stage to hawk their agenda. The storming of Area 51 that had millions of people on Facebook claiming they were going to attend went out with a fizzle. Around 40 people showed up at 3 a.m. before being shooed away by law enforcement. No aliens were freed, no Naruto's were run, no energies were drank, no alien butt cheeks were clapped, and no Kyle's did whatever it is that Kyle's do when they don't have any drywall to punch within a 50 mile radius. One man was arrested for public urination, which kind of sums up the entirety of the event. So now internet stormers and keyboard warriors will adopt the moniker, live wrong and posture. It will be accompanied by a wanking motion. VA Secretary Robert Wilkie is kicking out several congressmen from the VA hospitals. House member Brian Mast, an EOD veteran, is calling the move personal and not business. Wilkie had stated in a letter that the hospitals wanted the space for clinical use. Mast has contested that it was actually personal and over a hearing in April where Mast put pressure on Wilkie for reform. Mass grilled him on long-standing security issues and suicides and pressed him for a commitment to visit. So now, Wilkie is kicking out the congressman. Veterans have stated that having a rep there gives them a voice and a place to address their concerns. As a result, a proposal is in the works to have a rep's office in the VA. The next step from here will be weapon selection followed by trial by combat. You know, I didn't want to do it, but God hates a coward. We're going to cover the thing no one else has been willing to cover. In Jeffrey Epstein news... Oh! Oh! The Anti-Defamation League has officially listed the OK symbol and the bowl cut to the list of hate symbols. A mass murdering kid had a bowl cut, so now it's a hate symbol. Seriously though, a bowl cut. He had a bowl cut. He also had a t-shirt on. Should we ban t-shirts? Hot t-shirts are a hate symbol. He had jeans on. Should we label those as a hate symbol? Shoes, clearly a hate symbol. I've seen a lot of people lately with shoes on and I think they hate people. You know, now that I think about it, 100% of all mass killers have been wearing some form of footwear. Now I just want you to consider, just for a second, that we all know this is bullshit and we're all just gonna go along with it anyways. You gotta stretch before you reach that far, fellas. And finally, in Florida man news, a Florida couple stopped at a truck stop petting zoo in Louisiana. Because apparently that's a thing. The story goes that the husband was throwing treats to the couple's dog, which happened to be in a camel enclosure. The Florida woman crawled underneath the fence to get into the pen to get her dog back. That's when the camel sat down on top of her. In an act of self-preservation, that's when this superhero did what anyone would do in this situation. She bit the camel on the balls. Authorities charged both with harassing an animal and a leash law violation. The woman went to the hospital and the camel is fine, but was quoted as saying, that lady is nuts. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already, and I promise we do not want to cover President Trump every single week, but we have to.